Well, I don't know if anyone else is going to join us, but I have a number of slides to get through. Um, I did put the QR code that links to the Google version of this uh, because I talk quickly and I'm covering a lot of a lot of information. So the title of this session is using DevOps and WebOps to empower site builders. Until today, I didn't know that Princeton called their install profile site builder. So this is not that. Uh, if you're here to hear about that, you're going to be uh, disappointed. Um, so I did a session at Stanford's uh, webcam uh, about replacing expensive RFI forms with web form. So we use a lot of different form solutions at the University of Colorado. And uh, I had the opportunity to replace them with complete open source solution, except for the fact that we integrated with part on Salesforce. But other than those commercial solutions, everything was open source, and we got a lot of benefits from that. Um, so this is looking at the same project uh, and talking about what we did next uh, after that phase. So my name is Kevin Reinen. I am now a principal web application developer. Uh, this is the first time in my career that Drupal was not part of my job title. Uh, so it represents a shift at our university where our CMS developers are no longer only working in Drupal. We integrate with a lot of other things and we work with a lot of different platforms. I was formerly the manager of product development at our Boulder campus where I helped grow uh, our CMS as a service platform uh, from around 200 sites to 1,000 sites. Those sites are still in Drupal 7. Uh, so unlike Jill's presentation from uh, the previous session, uh, we are still struggling to get all of those sites migrated. Uh, I chair the Drupal Association's licensing working group now. Uh, this is the group that brought you things like package distributions on Drupal.org. We would vet third-party packages to make sure that the license was compliant with the GPL. We answer questions around Creative Commons licensed images, fonts, uh, different things that people add to modules, and we try to keep what you download from Drupal.org as GPL compliant as possible. I also quit Drupal for two years. Uh, I, at DrupalCon Nashville, I wore a shirt and blogged about how Drupal 8 might not be the best solution to move a thousand Drupal 7 sites to, and challenged people to convince me that I was wrong. Uh, some people were very optimistic about where Drupal was headed and what was going to be possible. Uh, I didn't end up buying it, and the amount of work it was going to take to get to back to feature parity for all of these sites seemed pretty overwhelming with only six months until the end of life of Drupal 7. Ha! You, you got me. Uh, so I left and did Salesforce development while Drupal 7's end of life just kept getting extended. And the team that took over uh, at Boulder uh, continued to try to find ways to, to migrate all of those sites to a modern Drupal platform. Meanwhile, I came back to Drupal uh, after failing to find a, another CMS solution that did everything Drupal did. And now I do a mix of Drupal and Salesforce development for high profile <laughs> marketing sites. But I only maintain three very important sites at the university but three sites. So my previous work with a thousand sites uh, doesn't influence what I'm talking about today. Uh, so I'm gonna break this down kind of to, to how we're doing this, um, focusing on the people, the process, and the technology. So at Stanford, I talked about how our team is building ambitious digital experiences for ambitious site builders. And I've changed that now, that we're not building it for them, we're building it with them. So quick history of the online cu.edu project. This is the project where all of this work is coming from. Uh, back in the 90s, we had one campus decide that online education might be a thing, and they started marketing their online programs. Uh, that campus uh, spun off their medical schools into a separate campus and so by the very nature of breaking the campus up from one to two there were now two sites represented in this online marketing uh, i got involved in 2015 when we launched connect.cu.edu this is the first time all four of our campuses were represented in a single website that promoted our online programs that site was driven from Oracle Campus Solutions. It was an API-driven site 
the content that we had in our SIS system was what was presented on the website. It wasn't a marketing site where you designed around it. It was more of a course catalog. But in 2019, we got a new president at the University of Colorado, and he had a vision to create a fifth campus that would be an online-only campus. Seemed like a popular thing to do during a pandemic. Uh, so we started working on uh, that vision. And in 2020, uh, our central IT group, University Information Systems, where I work now, started building their first internal web team. And that's where uh, I moved back from advancement in Salesforce to doing Drupal again. And so the Stanford webcam session is recorded. You can watch this. But we focused a lot on the composable marketing solutions. And now you've probably heard this quite a bit, um, being able to not just use Composer, but build sites based on building blocks and integration is very popular. And in that session, I go through the whole nuts to bolts, how a lead becomes a enrolled student. I'm not going to go through all of that now. Uh, one thing I didn't share back then, because uh, it doesn't really help support the idea, uh, is that during the same time we were uh, launching these online sites, we were adopting Drupal as a university. So 10 years ago, a team from the University of Colorado Boulder presented at DrupalCon Denver. There were 25 Drupal sites at that time. So now we have over 1,400 sites across all four campuses. Uh, we support 4,300 content editors. These are all self-service. Uh, you don't call our teams to build a page or build a site. You're given an empty install profile and you build your own site with the training we provide. We've also standardized on Pantheon for our service provider. So we have four different Pantheon workspaces based on the different campuses and system. Uh, and what that meant was it was very easy. Oh, here's the point where I, I quit Drupal for a bit. Uh, but it was very easy for the campuses to launch their own version of Connect. So I was working at the Boulder campus at the time we built that site for system, and we're like, great, everyone's you know represented on one site. We're all one system. This totally makes sense. And then immediately after launching that site, our head of strategic relations came and said, I want you to do the same thing, but just put CU Boulder's logo on it and ignore the fact that the other campuses exist. And every other campus did the same thing. So it wasn't really a shock to me that when we got another new new president uh, that they changed directions again and uh, we sunset the original single site and broke the site up into four campus branded sites because every CU campus wants to believe that they are the only campus and that's just the way higher ed works. So the current sites are forks. Um, this was done out of uh, necessity for timeline reasons. We uh, Pantheon makes it very easy to take an existing site and clone the containers three times and then just go and delete the other campus's content out of each site and change the theme and there, you, you're done with that, that project. So we did that cloning process, but those sites weren't really designed to be maintained. It was designed as one site and broken up. So the each site as soon as we launched them started making customizations so the themes were obviously customized to change the branding uh, but now they've added content types modified views the code base is completely different or not completely different but different enough that it's very inefficient for us to to make changes so we have a multiplier effect on how long it takes to get work done because we have multiple people working on these sites, and every time I go to make a change to a site, I have to look at what was done in the last month to know whether that site can be updated just like the other ones or not. And so obviously what we want when running a Drupal at scale is to divide the effort for features by the number of sites that are using them. And we currently can't do that in this model. So I've been doing Drupal a while, and I feel like at, especially in the higher ed space, we've benefited from WYSIWYG editors. 
This is really the thing that got us through the last decade. We made editing content easy enough for subject matter experts. We solved things like, I forgot my password, by implementing single sign-on solutions. So every Drupal site at the university is the same password and username as the email system, so we don't have to support users. Um, we generate image derivatives. No one needs to open Photoshop and resize an image or convert it to a PNG or whatever the correct format is. And then we got really fancy and we allowed them to start placing blocks and controlling elements of the layout. But ultimately, these are cookie cutter approaches. There's a limit to what you can do with that approach. And even at the Boulder campus where we created lots of different cookie cutter patterns, you're still limited. Like I can look at a site and tell it's a Web Express site just by how the layouts work. And that worked well, and that's how the current sites, the cur current modern Drupal sites are maintained uh, now as well. But there's a limit to what you can do there. And our users are getting more sophisticated. They now know about things like Wix and Squarespace. Whereas a decade ago, if you installed Google Analytics, people's minds were blown. Like, this is great. So people want to do more. And we spend a lot of time telling them no, that they, they can't do it unless they're a Drupal developer. So our environment has really changed. Um, and I'm sure most people, regardless of industry, uh, are being asked to do more with less. So for the online projects, we had a very small team supporting one large site with lots of change requests from the campuses. Now we have multiple sites and half the team. So a lot of that team moved on to other projects and we're still maintaining those same sites. Uh, so we were really successful over the last decade of scaling Drupal. And as Jill was talking about in the last session with Princeton migrating a thousand sites, we end up being victims of our own success. So we have more sophisticated site owners who are using tools like Google Tag Manager. And I was just talking to Brian about this. The Google Tag Manager essentially creates a backdoor for the marketing team to inject whatever JavaScript they want onto whatever page they want. And so we're seeing people work around uh, our attempt to lock them in to following best practices. So we need more help. There aren't enough Drupal developers available to do the work that needs to be done uh, to manage the number of sites we're managing. So how do we get from only giving people specific cookie cutters to not having people blow their sites up because they have no idea how to make cookies. So I don't know if any of you were webmasters at one point, maybe some of you still are. Uh, at the University of Colorado, we essentially eliminated this role. So in the past, every college or every department had someone with webmaster in their title who was the only person we trusted to edit content using Dreamweaver or front page or whatever the solution was. They would get a request via email or a Word doc and they would make that change. So the way I used to think about Drupal and CMS projects is I'm a developer, I build an application that is a content management system configuration. And then I give that to subject matter experts who then use that application to edit the content. And the look and feel of the site is made by a designer and everyone has their role and we all work together for a short period of time to get the site launched and then the designer and developer move on, leaving the subject matter expert with whatever solution we left them. That's not really the, the world we live in anymore. Our marketing teams have gotten substantially more sophisticated. They are writing queries in Google Analytics that exceed anything we're doing in Drupal um, as far as you know, a basic view of, of content. And so we ask them to you know, create reports on the effectiveness of a marketing campaign where the leads are coming in from six different sources. And then we tell them, wait, but we don't trust you to filter content uh, by type. Like that would be that would be too much. So it's kind of insulting to some of these people to lock them out of these things. So that's some of the why. And I don't think this is specific to higher education or or CU. Uh, so the how um, we start getting into DevOps and web ops. So how many of you are familiar with web ops as a term? Some. So this is 
Pantheon's kind of flavored version of, of DevOps. I, I don't like having more terms for the same thing, and and I don't like a lot of things in general. I'm usually pretty vocal about the things I don't like. So I didn't like the idea of web ops when Pantheon started promoting it, but we're a Pantheon customer, so it's kind of hard to get away from. They just talk about it all the time. Uh, well, I finally broke down and started reading the documentation for that certification, and the idea is actually pretty good. It's not just DevOps, and it focuses on the challenge that I have in my job, which is collaborating closely with, with marketing groups. Um, this statement is really hard to argue with as far as like who wouldn't want cross-functional collaboration and uh, automating repeatable tasks. Um, but really, it's this piece that, that kind of sold me. And it's this idea that we spent the last decade establishing credibility for running Drupal well. And so the idea that sites aren't down is kind of key before you can do anything else. Where we struggle now is at the top of this with impact because people, marketing groups want to change and pivot quickly and our structure doesn't always uh, support that. So with, when we were self-hosted on-prem at the University of Colorado, we had to say no to a lot of things because a random function for one website could take the whole infrastructure down. Moving to Pantheon, we don't have that limitation anymore. Each site is containerized. They will only impact themselves. So there's a lot more like warning people of bad ideas, but letting them experience the pain anyway available now. But we haven't really changed our, our features. This part of the, of the web ops, um, I don't know if they're trying to appeal to developers, calling this magical, uh, or uh, that you know our talent you know allows the marketing group to achieve their KPIs. I don't know who this is for. When I read this, I, I got the Liam Neeson, you know, developers possess a unique skill uh, idea. But you know, it's it is what it is. Um, so what we're trying to do now is provide bumpers for people that we were previously saying no to, so that they can uh, work with us more closely and achieve their own goals. They can fail quickly. They can try things that we would have told them no before. And so from a development perspective, I'm really focused on stability, security, maintenance, compliance, those types of things. Uh, the people I work closely with are focused on lead generation, unique users, tracking UTMs, online sales, meaning in our world, donations or enrollments. And so they live and die by these KPIs. I live and die by uptime metrics. So somehow we have to learn to, to work together. So what, what is a site builder? Who are, who are we talking about? Who are we enabling? If you Google this, the, the top results are all products. Uh, so if you, even if you Google Drupal site builder, the content you get back is from 20 years ago uh, that's completely irrelevant. You have to really dig down. Oh, you also find this. Uh, so I'm talking about people. And so eventually you find this Acquia certification. Uh, this is an interesting certification because they charge you $150 and the training for it is all on Drupal.org. So you're essentially paying for proctoring that you've read the Drupal.org documentation. But it is the type of uh, experience that, that I'm hoping to collaborate with moving forward and gets into things like building your own content types, when to use different field types, how to edit views. So in the Salesforce world, the equivalent of that role is a Salesforce certified admin. This is someone who doesn't write code, but just configures Salesforce with a no-code, low-code approach. And Salesforce administrators, especially if you work in higher ed, you know that they're a known entity, and you can hire people with this certification, and you can expect them to be able to do the job on day one. So we don't have that in, in the Drupal space. We've been talking about ambitious site builders for a few years now, but even in our own marketing material, we don't define who that is or what that person would be expected to be. And so we see this in the higher ed space where people are not developers, they're not really web designers, they're really good at building sites and understand the Drupal ecosystem, but 
we don't have a job title for them. We don't even recognize their content editors to us, even though they can do substantially more. So to support people in that role, we have to do a few different things. We have to agree on what the common site structure is, and that's with install profiles and upstreams. I'm not gonna talk about the specifics of those. There's tons of information about that. We have to define how sites are customized. What are the, what are the bumpers we're putting up for the bowling? What are we gonna allow and not allow uh, in order to enable and empower people? And then we have to build, buy, and configure a bunch of complexity and then hide the fact that that exists. So at CU, um, for our modern Drupal sites, everything's built on a common install profile we call the CU Starter Kit Upstream. Uh, very uh, exciting title. And within that, we have a single theme that allows the campuses to choose their own branding. So that allows them to change the logo and the colors without using a completely different theme. And then we deploy common features for something like the online sites using either modules that we develop on Drupal.org or custom modules that we deploy via packages. At the very tip of this, and it's really important that this be the smallest amount of work, we have site-specific customizations. And so that's the area where we need to empower more people. And in a lot of the cases, we're working with the campus web teams who run hundreds of Drupal sites so telling them that they can't make changes because we don't trust them uh, is not uh, a conversation anyone wants to have. But that pyramid is really what you see above the water. What makes that work is all DevOps, web ops behind the scenes. So you don't need to know all of this if you're not a developer, if you're not, um, if you want to be the site builder to leverage it. You just need to understand that we're trying to make this look less complicated than it is. So in 2022, this is the slide I showed about our current DevOps configuration. And we're moving stuff between different Git instances all over the place. We have local development that we use DDEV for, and that allows us to use the same code base to load different sites on different Pantheon workspaces. If I had presented this, to my boss and my boss's boss and said, all right, you want this website. This is what I have to build in order for you to get a slideshow and a video hero background. They don't, they don't want to see this. CU is not a technology company. We're not a software engineering firm or an academic institution. And outside of our IT group, this type of complexity is avoided at all cost. So, Unfortunately, um, this actually got more complicated because we started leveraging autopilot. How many of you have used autopilot, know about it, using visual regression testing with some other method? Okay, so yeah, so autopilot is a tool that Pantheon sells. Um, you could do visual regression testing many different ways, but we're already paying for this, so we wanted to use it. And it gives you a nice, easy to use interface, um, allows you to drag back and forth. You can see the before and after. Uh, and this is really designed for the person I'm talking about in the role of site builder. This is not a developer tool. I actually don't care if the padding gets adjusted by 10 pixels on your hero section. I care that these leads get into Salesforce. So it's not really my job to decide whether this change is too much or too little to deploy this. So what I'm hoping is the next 10 years of Drupal, um, we spend it empowering site builders to collaborate with developers and we hide a lot of the complexity that, that makes that work. So this is Pantheon's standard workflow. This exists in just about every hosting provider, dev test live. Uh, it gets a little more complicated when you introduce multi-dev into the, into the mix. These are additional containers that are sped, st stood up either to allow an individual developer to work or on a feature branch or the QA team to review that. And then we add autopilot to the mix, which for our use case right now is just another multi-dev instance. So obviously at the same time neil is talking about the progress being made uh, moving drupal entirely to gitlab and eventually we'll get off of patches and making comments on nodes to talk about issues we'll be able to at each other uh, in the threads it'll all be wonderful so there's a lot going on with gitlab 
uh, on Drupal.org. Most modules have published test coverage now uh, that has moved to the GitLab CI. It's running a lot faster than previous testing infrastructure. Uh, we run GitLab at CU as well. So we take things from Drupal.org in GitLab. We use Composer to bring them into our own GitLab environment. And then we actually push them to yet another Git instance at Pantheon. And then we add it into Pantheon's workflow. But wait. Uh, so Pantheon, if you manage a custom upstream, an install profile that's shared between lots of different container instances, you get a dashboard that looks like this when updates are available. So this is you know, pretty decent. I thought this made it easy enough for non-developers to deploy updates to their site. Works like you know, updates to your iPhone or updates to your laptop. Uh, the site builders and non-developers I work with didn't agree. They, they don't care for this. They don't want to look at this. Uh, they want developers to come in here and push this apply update button. So what we've done is we stopped pushing things through the Pantheon dashboard and we now have autopilot do the work for us. So we're still on the development side, we're still doing everything the way we always did it. But we just let autopilot go out every day, not only looking at our upstream updates, but anything coming from composer or module updates on Drupal.org. So we also use pull mirroring. So pull mirroring is a feature of GitLab. Uh, GitHub has an equivalent function. So every five minutes, we take the any updates made from any of the multi-dev instances to Pantheon, including what Autopilot automatically deploys, and we pull it back down into our own GitLab instance. And that's where the developers work. That's where issues are tied to pull requests. And then if we want, we can run additional testing for each individual site project. And then if those tests pass, automatically deploy that to the test instance. And if we had great test coverage, we could confidently deploy that directly to live without any human beings having to do anything. We're definitely not there yet. So I know some of you are thinking, because I said this was for everyone. And I've been talking about a lot of technical things, and I've tried to keep it pretty high level and draw lots of pretty pictures. But this is, this is complicated. So the good news is we're using Drupal modules to bring most of the work for site builders back into the CMS. We don't ask our site builders to log in to GitLab. That's completely hidden from them. And we use modules to allow them to create pull requests from the CMS instances. So what that ends up looking like is the code goes up, the content is created on the live CMS instances, but configuration changes from these users we've now empowered come back into GitLab without those users ever needing to log into GitLab. And then this is a module I wrote that I really wish I didn't have to. Um, so Pantheon provides autopilot. Uh, currently, the dashboard to navigate to autopilot requires you to have a workspace admin level access. Even though you can get into autopilot itself, you can't get to it unless you know the URL. So I wrote this really simple module that adds a link for each site into the admin toolbar. And so users who we've given access to autopilot can skip all of the Pantheon dashboard interfaces and go directly to the visual regression testing for their specific site. This module has absolutely no configuration. It pulls all of the values it needs from the Pantheon instance. So you just install it, decide who gets to see it, and that's all it really does. Uh, the Pantheon engineering team has assured me that they've increased the priority of being able to navigate, uh, non-admin users being able to navigate to Autopilot, and that will be rolling out in future releases. Uh, but currently, if you give someone access to be a member of a site team on Pantheon, they can manage the visual regression testing. They just can't get to it. So, uh, yeah, so this is what we want those users to be able to get to because they are the subject matter experts for that. So site builders, we're now allowing them to change configurations on modules and not just config ignore those. We're not relying on developers to remember to go into every single site and do a fresh config export before rolling out config changes. 
We're allowing site builders to change permissions. So as you add functionality to a site, deciding who gets to do what is traditionally a developer's job. That's kind of silly when we hardly know the people that are doing the editing work and what they're capable of. So we're not, uh, we're def keeping common roles, but what those roles can do will vary between sites. And what I want to do, and we're not there yet, is I want our site builders to go through training the same way that users who we give permission to collect personal identifiable information at the university go through training for FERPA. The same way that anyone deals with credit cards at the university has to go through PCI compliance training. We currently hand Drupal sites over and don't require anything and then we get upset if people do things that aren't the best idea. I don't expect site builders to ever know whether a field should be a Boolean or a Varkar. That's, that's just not what they do. But the thing is, you don't need to know that as much anymore. We put an enormous amount of effort in improving the field API UI for developers. Like, I, I didn't need those additional icons describing what a telephone field looks like. That, that's for site builders. So developers will still have to deal with Composer, adding modules to a site, um, deploying those Composer updates, uh, adding JavaScript where it's actually efficiently targeting, uh, you know, if X, then add Y. Uh, so, and updates to our install profile. So if it's a change that needs to happen at for all sites, that's still gonna have to go through development. But we can unlock functionality at each individual site. We don't have to have these sites locked down so you can only change what we've enabled with cookie cutter methods. We can allow people to add fields to content types. We've made it super easy. And this is what Salesforce admins do in the CRM. They are customizing objects based on business processes that they understand. So why wouldn't we take the same approach for the people who understand their content, the subject matter experts, and the marketing groups that are building these sites up? Uh, if you were in the last session, uh, this module was referenced repeatedly as a pain point. Uh, I am the last active maintainer of this module. There's still some like 15,000 sites using it. This seemed like a good idea at the time, uh, but what we've learned is if you allow people to put code in strange places and override code like CSS that should exist in a theme, you're gonna end up paying a price later on. You're creating debt that you will eventually have to deal with. So why not allow them to put the code in the right place? So I'm gonna show just a few things in our configuration. Um, here and then I'll open it up to questions. So this is a, a Drupal 10 site that, that we have running. Um, so a lot of this admin toolbar is you know, stuff you see on every site. Actually, let me go to the live instance. Where am I at here? Too many tabs. So this is just a, it is a live site, but it is a site that we just play around with. Um, so the site itself, lost what? Lost it. I lost my internet too. Oop, you lost the, f oh, I see. I'm not sharing. Okay. I got to do this neck craning thing. All right. Oh no, I can't see it here. Okay. No, nope. no, I've blown up my theme. So this is the icons that we've added. So config changes um, is the module that allows the site builder to create a uh, merge request without ever logging in to GitLab. So the eight here shows the number of configuration changes made on the site. Anyone who's conf familiar with uh, config management, you know, is familiar with these interfaces, I can go here, I can see what exactly changed, um, but most of the people who have made changes with the UI aren't going to uh, aren't, aren't going to know what any of that means. So uh, in here, I can just make a note of what the commit message is. I pick what I want to include, and I click create 
GitLab merge request. And then magically, uh, through the magic of web ops, uh, this merge request will get created. And whatever testing we have configured in the CI for that site instance will be rerun. So as a developer, I don't need, unless Pantheon's down. <laughs> Ouch. All right, and this is why we use slides. Yes, exactly. So uh, let's see if it actually created the merge request, or I can go back to uh, another one. Um, so in our GitLab environment, we set up private repos for every site project that we're running this way now. Oh, it did create the... Hey, it still worked. Um, so in here, as a developer, I can run whatever tasks I want, I can review the changes, and I can get that merged into the master branch so that any additional branches and feature development that developers are doing actually takes into consideration the changes that a site builder made the day that they made it uh, on the live site. So that's kind of this disconnect and communication problem that we have at CU where everyone's really busy, there's lots of things going on, we have unlocked features for site builders already and they forget to mention that, oh by the way, I changed this thing and then we deploy something that requires a config import and those changes then go away. So this is how we prevent that. So the little icon in the toolbar lets them know that there are config changes that they need to uh, deploy. Um, it also, let's see if I get that site back, um, allows, oh, I got a 500 error on the site. Not a Pantheon. Sorry, Pantheon. Um, we can flip between the different instances, uh, so they can flip between their dev, test, live. This was something that I thought was kind of easy to understand, like just like a PowerPoint, if you create a new version of it and name it underscore old, uh, that there'd be multiple copies of the same site, you know, it's, it's okay, copying it is easy, uh, but a lot of people had their, their mind blown. And then this uh, option here is what takes us into autopilot. And um, let's see if we have any failures. So I can jump directly into autopilot without having to be a full admin on the site. <coughs> I don't even know what's different here. But I get to drag this, oh, these are 0% difference, so it's gonna flag it every time. But that's uh, really all I had to run through. Again, these slides are all available. All of the code and get configuration to do the CI to deploy to Pantheon, it's all publicly available. Um, I do want to call out that, oh, I don't have this up here anymore, um, that I uh, used to have to Google Kevin Beard Drupal, but if you Google Drupal Beard, you can now find me. So I grow pretty epic beards every year. Uh, that's kind of my trademark. This is a very uh, new beard. Uh, but if you see me at other conferences, I usually have uh, substantial facial hair. But I've finally taken uh, the keywords, just Drupal beard. So that's all you have to remember. Guy with a beard, works in Drupal. You'll be able to find me and ask whatever questions you have. And I really, if you think I'm wrong, if you think I'm crazy for challenging uh, the status quo with site building, I, I'm willing to accept that. I thought CSS injector was a good idea too. Who knew? Any questions? John? Uh, that module with the GitLab config, where is that? Um, that's, so there's config patch is the core module, and then uh, 1x internet wrote the GitLab API. I should add that that requires project tokens, which are only available if you're doing a self-hosted GitLab instance or using ultimate or premium, I think is what GitLab calls their, their licensing terms. So you have to generate uh, a token, if you do that with a service account, then every instance you add that service account to will then be able to communicate with that. But the, the module's really nice because it works from any instance of Drupal that has it installed. So even if you're running it on DDEV, you can still go directly from DDEV put, pushing the config. Uh, so it's, it's just like a GitLab feature? Like so it, the, the creating the merge request is just using the GitLab API. 
it's just taking the yeah it's all all built in so yeah so it's and then you know the nice thing about using it so you can do the same thing with GitHub. I want to be clear there. There's no magic in what GitLab's doing. The nice thing for us about leveraging GitLab is Drupal is also is in GitLab, so we're able to use a lot of the same CI um, processes that that are being worked out for Drupal by the Drupal Association. Anyone else? Yeah. When you got to Salesforce land, did you feel well prepared with your Drupal background? <sighs> so I was pretty pissed off when I moved to Salesforce and the, uh, the, the, the data modeling, the content modeling, the fact that you had to you know, get a certification before people would let you do that, I thought was ridiculous. Like you're adding a field to an object and that requires a certification. Uh, the things I, I learned a lot I really thought the grass was going to be greener on the other side, but it turns out it just takes you a little while to realize that it's all the same. So there's a lot of things that I'm really excited about coming in Drupal, like the schema.org blueprints module. Salesforce has something called the EDA, the Education Data Architecture, which by standardizing on the way things like programs, colleges, uh, courses look, then vendors are able to build solutions that say, this will work as long as you have the EDA data architecture installed. So I learned a lot of those things. Uh, I also learned that working in Salesforce for two years, getting certifications, going to training, uh, you can do that on a project that doesn't launch for another two years. So where in Drupal, I can turn things around, like I don't like the way something works, I can just go in and change it. I don't like the way Pantheon's dashboard navigation works, I can write a module and fix that. Uh, that's not how it works in Salesforce. There is an open source component to it, and I highly encourage people to go to the, the Open Commons sprints, um, but it's a completely different world where uh, people are sold things, it takes years to figure out that what the marketing hype said about the product is not reality. Um, Josh from Pantheon uh, gave me a great piece of advice at a call recently um, where I was asking, how do you combat the, the marketing of the Salesforce juggernaut within higher ed? I mean, they're just telling you that everything is rainbows and unicorns if you just keep buying Salesforce. And he said, well, view source on salesforce.com. They're, they're running WordPress. If their CMS solutions are so great, why can't they use them for their own marketing? So there's, there's a good mix of open source, CMS, CRM, uh, when things work together. But yeah, I wasn't prepared for the, the sales side of it. When I went to uh, my first Salesforce conference, uh, I, I was part of the, like 10% minority wearing tennis shoes and not pointy dress shoes. And that gave me a pretty good hint that I was at the wrong, wrong conference. Right? Uh, yeah. You have the PRs, and you said there's some CI running on that. Right, right. so whatever, so we're, the PR is trying to merge into master. You can configure this however you want. Yeah. Um, and so whatever you configure in the GitLab CI to run for that site on master. Our goal is to run site-specific testing. So if, you, if you're customizing a site, if you're building features and functionality, we want to capture that with testing. And then the development team will do all the testing on the standard publishing features of the install profile. Yeah, my question was where, like, is that running? So do you have it running just in GitLab? Right. You know, so we have. So, so we have. Yeah. So we have uh, the, the with our package. We get runner time from GitLab, and we're just running testing in there. Okay. But so it's we don't. In there, yeah, so yeah we don't. Like an accessible site. And that yeah, correct. And that is largely for security reasons at the university. So we can do some things publicly, and there are public repos in that GitLab instance. But then, like the site-specific functionality, copies of sites, any kind of data that would have to all go through security to do it, like with Travis or Jenkins or something yeah. out in the public. Yep. Um, is there any potential issues with Git conflicts when merging? Um, that's it. Sorry, I, I, I went over that stuff really fast. So uh, the Git pulls are every five minutes to keep master, and then we do a force on the push oh, on the deployment. Yeah. So the, the GitLab instance will always overwrite right. what if we get out of sync. Is there any time when there's a module required on the local Pantheon site and not the upstream? All the time. 
Exactly. That is what we're trying to solve. So that's the, and again, I didn't get into the structure for the development, but we spent a ton of time in Drupal 9 figuring out how to split our composer files correctly yeah. and how to manage those things. There are some things you still can't do where you have to declare things like with a web form, for example. They want their libraries declared in the composer file. You can't do that in the upstream. It has, it's a root-only element and has to be done um, at the, the root of the project. So we're, we're going up to, to lunch. Um, I don't want to keep anyone from eating, but I'm happy to answer whatever questions people have. And if you decide to go this route, I'd love to hear about whether it works or not, so I can stop doing it if it really is a bad idea again.